Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, just a few reminders before we dive into our webinar today, just to make sure you can download the slides and event materials for today's webinar at the oneop.org event, 118700 there at the bottom of the screen. And for tech support, please email at oneop at gmail.com. When using the chat comments, please be sure to select all panelists and attendees reply option before sending so we can see that conversation. Carrie, I might need you to advance the slide. So once again, um, just continuing with our webinar introduction, I'm Christina Adam Smith, one of the program coordinators for the Nutrition and Wellness Division of One Op, formerly known as the Military Families Learning Network. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on nutrition and individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Next slide, please. In case you're just joining us for the first time, I want to give you a quick tour of our platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to review the slides we're sharing. If you're unable to see them or have any other difficulties, please email us at contact at oneop.org for tech support. As some of you may have already done, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod for conversation and questions. To embed that chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversations, conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You will then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of the screen. From there, just click the chat bubble icon when typing questions or comments. Please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone is able to view them in the chat pod. Note that the slides and resources are available for download on the event page for today's session. We will be covering continuing education information at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned at the end if you're interested in continuing education credits or certificate of attendance. We're pleased to introduce you to our new name, OneOp. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Hiwan Gray. Dr. Gray is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and received her PhD in behavioral nutrition from Columbia University. She has extensive experience in obesity prevention and nutrition education for children and adolescents, and has conducted several studies related to nutrition in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Her research focuses on developing and evaluating nutrition education intervention programs, especially for children and adolescents. Currently, she is the principal investigator of the NIH funded project R21HD10682 <laughs> that aims to evaluate the feasibility and efficacy of nutrition education intervention for children with ASD and their parents. I am now pleased to turn this over to Dr. Hiwan Gray for our webinar today. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, today's learning objectives are to recognize an increased risk of obesity and non-communicable diseases in individuals with autism spectrum disorder, to understand specific mealtime and nutritional challenges in this population, and to apply effective nutrition education strategies to improve mealtime and eating behaviors uh, for this population. So before I start, I want to understand who uh, I'm talking to today. So um, I'm gonna do the poll. If you don't see the poll pop-up window, please uh, feel free to write your response in the chat pod. So during your regular practice, how frequently do you work with individuals with autism spectrum disorder? I'll give you about 15 seconds. Thank you. I see that uh, more than 20% uh, work with individuals with autism spectrum disorder and at least 40% um, um, have at least occasionally working with this population. It was really good to know. So ASD, uh, 
is a developmental disability with persistent impairment in social interaction, commu communication, and or behavior. So recent data show that one in 44 children in the uni United States have been identified with ASD, and uh, it is more common in boys compared to girls. Uh, boys are more likely to have um, ASD, like four times more likely to uh, be diagnosed with ASD. So this uh, slide shows the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder over time. As you can see, over the past two decades, uh, the diagnosis of autism has been drastically increased. The current prevalence is approximately 10% higher than the estimate in 2014, and it's almost three times higher than the first estimate reported in 2000. We know little about the causes of autism, uh, but these are some known risk factors that are associated with increased ASD diagnosis. Um, having a sibling with ASD, having certain genetic or chromosomal conditions, uh, experiencing complications at birth or being born to older parents. Um, there has been no known dietary, specifically dietary or nutritional risk factor that might cause autism. I want to point it out, uh, out the, some history behind the, uh, the relationship between uh, MR, MMR vaccine and ASD. There is a myth uh, out there that some parents believe that there are some uh, significant correlation between two. The article uh, published in 1998 uh, in Lancet uh, by Dr. Wakefield uh, reported that there is significant association between MMR vaccine and ASD, and they got really uh, got huge media attention and um, it has been really controversial since then. Um, one of the, the investigative reporter uh, alerted the journal in 20, 2005 and uh, indicating that the study might be flawed by severe research misconduct, conflict of interest, or probably uh, firsthood. So the journal actually investigated further um, and eventually we attracted the uh, article and um, the British Medical Association took disciplinary action against the, uh, Dr. Wakefield. And um, it turned out that the study was highly biased and the association between the vaccine and ASD was uh, assessed uh, mainly with the self report questionnaire uh, by uh, on parents' perception. So it was not measured by objective or reliable measures. And then since then, numerous studies uh, have been conducted to really see a direct connection between the MMR vaccine and autism, and there has been no link. Um, especially in 2015, JAMA published a really, uh, the largest study to date, analyzing the health records of over 95,000 children. And the study confirmed that there is no relationship between the vaccine and ASD. So moving on to chronic disease risk, children with ASD uh, has a greater, uh, have greater risk of development uh, of obesity compared to neurotypical children, up to 41%. And so there's one meta-analysis study showing that uh, children with ASD living in the United States, United States have particularly higher prevalence of obesity compared to other part of the world. And non-white race, increasing age and female sex are potential factors. And uh, there are some known medication that are uh, related to uh, obesity uh, by increasing the appetite. So steroids, atypical antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, anticoagulants, and stimulants. Those are the uh, known 
medication that might be affecting appetite and then uh, increase the risk of obesity among children. So studies have shown that young adults and adults with ASD tend to have a higher prevalence of dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and some cancers. So these high diet-related disease risk may contribute to increased lifelong healthcare burden for this population. And uh, without intervention, children with ASD may have a higher risk for developing these chronic diseases by midlife. So now I'm gonna talk about specific challenges that uh, this population might have, uh, especially related to food and diet. Uh, there are common food allergies, food intolerance and sensitivities known uh, for this population. And GI symptoms are very common, especially constipation. Up to 84% of children with ASD uh, are reported to have constipation. And recent research show that gut microbiota dysbiosis is very common. And um, there are obvious mealtime eating behaviors issues. Um, they're known to be very uh, selective and uh, have problematic mealtime behaviors as well. So uh, our research team conducted a preliminary study in Florida to see what are the um, mealtime behavior challenges uh, among families with children with autism. So our study also consistently showed that the 74% uh, of our, our sample uh, resists trying new food. Almost all uh, or 97% avoid certain food and 63% of parents reported that they consider their children to be picky eaters. And dietary habits related to uh, autism, children with ASD tend to consume more juice and sweetened beverages and consume calories from high energy dense processed food and snacks and fewer fruits and vegetables compared to typically developing children. Uh, these poor dietary habits may contribute to increased rate of obesity and other diet related diseases. So um, this one shows also a very similar uh, patterns uh, from Italy. Uh, <clears throat> they, they found out that the children with ASD in their country also have higher amount of um, simple sugar intake processed and ultra processed carbohydrate and consume more uh, low and high fat animal pro proteins and low amount of fruits and vegetables. And children with ASD, uh, uh, children with ASD and food selectivity at the same time, they have lower annual intakes of vegetable proteins and fiber. So when we did the secondary analysis with our uh, preliminary data, uh, we also found the consistent outcomes. Uh, our sample showed the significantly low uh, healthy eating index scores that uh, is associated with dietary uh, quality. So uh, especially for whole fruit, total vegetables, dairy, total protein intakes, and seafood and pro uh, plant protein. And they consume more ultra processed food. Uh, it accounted for the majority of children with ASD's uh, energy intake. Um, mean was 63% of our population, our sample. And um, among our sample, picky eaters um, reported by parents had greater percent energy intake from ultra processed food compared to uh, non picky eaters. So because of this dietary patterns and mealtime behavior uh, problems, uh, they might have nutritional deficiency risk. So there have been uh, several meta-analysis and um, system review articles. Um, one article uh, found, out that found that the children with ASD had significantly lower intake of calcium and protein. And another article uh, with seven, 19 studies, 
concluded that in addition to calcium and protein, children with ASD tend to consume less um, minerals uh, and vitamins like phosphorus, selenium, vitamin D, thiamine, riboflavin, and vitamin B12. And some studies also reported low bone mineral density among children with ASD, uh, probably associated with the low calcium intake. However, any nutritional recommendations uh, should be tailored to individual cases because there are a lot of uh, variations in eating behaviors and food consumption uh, based on the individual food preferences. So in summary, there are various diet and GI related challenges related to ASD. And it is likely that these problems and ASD symptoms are interconnected. Um, and at this point, we do not know whether the ASD features cause, cause, it, cause dietary and GI problems or vice versa. It's more likely that it's gonna be the cycle. Um, if you have the, the really problematic dietary behaviors, in dietary pattern, it's likely that you're gonna, uh, the children might have the nutritional risk and cause um, the gut microbiotic dysbiosis and also induce the GI symptoms and it also uh, exacerbate the ASD symptoms. So it is important to um, conduct the nutritional assessments um, when the children come to the hospital or in your practice. So uh, based on the pediatric nutrition care manual uh, that you can subscribe from the, uh, the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, recommend that uh, you might do the anthropometrics assessment, feeding skills, including feeding milestones, mouth movements, sensory aspect, which is a huge part of the uh, problem in this population, utensils used in fluid intake. And some of the oral health uh, might be assessed, uh, bottle feeding, intended eating times or hypersensitivity to certain texture or um, the flavor and medications, self-injurious behavior. And again, uh, GI symptoms are common, especially constipation and you might conduct some lab tests, including vitamin D, ferritin, hemoglobin, uh, hematocrit, and dietary history, 24-hour recall, or three-day food records uh, to understand what type of food uh, the kids are eating and um, whether the kids are consuming a variety of food. So it is very important to understand um, the type of food and how much they're eating. This is a sample nutrition diagnostic statement for a child with ASD. Uh, if you have any audience, um, uh, di dietitians in the audience. So adequate mineral intake, uh, iron related to food selectivity and hypersensitivities as evidenced by food record analysis and low hematocrit. And in terms of the intervention, the Pediatric Nutrition Care Manual uh, have comments on special diets. So a lot of parents uh, are very interested in applying gluten-free or casein-free diet for their children. Uh, there are some anecdotal evidence that, that they might uh, improve the ASD symptoms. And supplements are very common to uh, some of the children having really uh, severe food selectivity, they might need to have the supplement. Um, the nutrition care manual said, despite many anecdotal reports, the efficacy of special diets and supplements uh, for treatment for, of ASD has not been proven in reproducible studies. So it is not recommended to have the, uh, these special diets generally for ASD. Um, however, you might consider, depending on the specific situation, uh, if the child really have the celiac disease, you 
might have to go on gluten-free diet. And so recommendation now is family-centered approach. Each family has to have their own uh, intervention plan and uh, conduct the intervention uh, based on the needs of the individual child. And some may need enteral tube feeding due to inadequate uh, intake, weight loss, and poor weight gain. There are some um, strategies, feeding strategies known to be effective, um, behavior-based interventions, um, mostly from the feeding therapy uh, books and um, the reports, repeated exposure, food chaining, paired preferred food with non-preferred food are examples to introduce new food and positive reinforce Reinforcement by uh, parents and caregivers are important. Mealtime routine and schedule. Having um, routine is very important for children with ASD, and it really helps children to uh, expect when they're going to eat, and uh, it helps to develop their self-regulation skills. And um, a lot of you might know that the some of the, the ASD therapy, they use food as rewards, uh, but uh, in the nutrition field, we know that using food as rewards will have negative impact on developing healthy eating behaviors for children. So it is very important to work multidisciplinary um, in, a, in a multidisciplinary team so that you have to communicate with other health providers uh, to make sure that you, your recommendation, not using food as rewards and other uh, team members aware that that's, uh, they might have negative impact on the, uh, the long-term eating behavior of the children. So among children with ASD, about five up to 10% of children with ASD uh, have severe food selectivity or feeding disorders. So they may be referred to a feeding therapy clinic. Um, however, most children um, with some type of feeding problems, but not severe food selectivity, uh, defined as uh, eating fewer than five food items, do not have access to nutrition programs that address feeding and nutritional issues. So. Uh, that's why parents are uh, drawn into the social media or other uh, resources uh, that are available out there. And uh, Nutrition Care Manual referred to the special education programs such as early intervention programs under Part C of the Individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act. I, I know that some of you are uh, the early intervention providers. So all the intervention program uh, that is for uh, children with a developmental delay uh, or di disabilities uh, under three years, uh, birth to three year old, they can have uh, the, the, the services and they also provide the nutrition assessment within the program. However, when I talked to the program directors, um, they indicated that there are short, shortage, there is a shortage of trained healthcare providers who can address specific nutritional issues for children with ASD. Um, and they want to refer to other nutritionists. And uh, I know that, that there are not many uh, nutritionists or dietitians who are trained in, um, kind of working with population with ASD. So that's kind of overall um, the current status of the, the research and uh, nutritional challenges related to ASD. So next uh, part, I will talk more about the, my current research and what are the, the effective uh, feeding strategies that I'm using in my re uh, research and interventions. So at this point, I wanna kind of open up uh, the floor to the audience and have some discussion. What are some of your experiences with the, with, with the individuals or children with the ASD? You can use the comment, um, the chat box. Hi, 
Thank you, Juan. There was one question that came through while people are kind of getting their thoughts together to be able to comment about, is there a test that parents can give to their children at home to learn more about their allergies? I know that there are some uh, food sensitivity tests out there, but I also know that those accurate, the accuracy of those tests are uh, sometimes questionable. So it's, it is always better to talk to the um, healthcare provider or pediatrician. Uh, I don't think that there is uh, uh, now really reliable test that parents can do at home. So I would recommend to uh, consult with your pediatrician or their pediatrician or healthcare providers. Let me see, I also find, yeah, one comment, I also find that many families do well with gluten and casein-free diets. They also end up doing well with dye-free and low preser preservative diet. Is there literature discussing the dye-free diets? Yes, um, there is a report not related to ASD, particularly, but related to uh, ADHD, the atten attention deficit disorder, uh, and the yellow uh, color dye might affect the hyperactivity uh, among those uh, children with di diagnosed with AS, uh, ADHD. So that's been uh, reported, but related to uh, specifically the diet, free diets affecting the children with ASD, I have uh, not seen any specific studies that has the, the positive impact on ASD outcomes. Now another person, I have worked a little bit with adults on the spectrum. I was not fully prepared to assist and learned in hindsight, how important recommending specific in instruction on what to do to assist in primary concerns. The more specific, the better. I totally agree with that. There are no home tests that are accurate. Yes. Um, I totally agree with that. Yeah, it has to be done with allergists. These home tests generally result in, yeah, restrictive diet that are not necessary. Thank you very much for that comment. Any tips for children with constipation? Yeah, there could be uh, various factors that might affect uh, constipation. So you have to really kind of understand uh, their dietary intake based on the dietary recall or a three day food record to see what they're eating and uh, to eat and to increase their uh, fruits and vegetable intake and fiber, uh, that's the main reason they might have the constipation that they're, they don't really consume um, enough uh, variety of food in their diet and also the hydration. Uh, some of the children might have low, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the low regulation for their, or the, low urge, urge for hunger. Um, so they, they don't feel that they're hung, hungry or thirsty. So they don't uh, express that uh, they need to uh, drink water. So it has to be very careful for parents to really kind of monitor their hunger cues and when they're thirsty and make sure that uh, they're regularly uh, drinking water and then consume enough high, uh, enough water and uh, hydrated. So that's one factor. So um, there are some feeding strategies that you can improve the diet or diet quality and improve the uh, fruits and vegetable vegetable intake and fiber. So that would be a good way to address. And then some of my um, cases um, also sh kind of talk about the, because of the limited number of food that the children are consuming, um, 
the not only the constipation, uh, but uh, the you usually the GI issues. It could be uh, because they're not eating the solid food uh, at all. So, so some uh, some children are just uh, drinking formula and um, way more amount than uh, usual. So that could also affect the in the entire the GI system, and that could affect the sleep as well. Again, okay, this constipation, um, it might have to have a long-term plan to improve the constipation. Uh, the main, main um, point is that they have to increase the variety of food they're uh, eating and then have enough hydration. I work with several children that have autism. They're overweight due to being picky eaters. Family continue to give them what we call is the crunchy carb diet only, which leads to, yeah, definitely them being overweight. So um, many of them have the sensory issues and uh, some drawn to the crunchy food, uh, only eat chips, a uh, certain color and, um, mainly processed food. And some children may have the uh, uh, sensitivity uh, so that they don't like uh, hypersensitivity. So they don't like the crunchy food. So they seek more milder uh, texture. So depending on the children, uh, you might see the variety of different problems. So um, I will talk more about your questions and comments at the end. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So I will introduce some of my research that I'm currently doing. Uh, I have the nutrition intervention study for children with ASD, uh, specifically who are enrolled in early intervention programs in Florida. Uh, it integrates feeding strategies that are known to be effective to manage mealtime behaviors and behaviorally focused nutrition intervention strategies uh, that are known to be effective in neurotypical children. Uh, before I uh, got into this topic, I worked with uh, school age children a lot and uh, we did our research team did a lot of nutrition education for school children, not specif specifically for children with, uh, with special needs. And um, again, individualized approach is very important. So I got into to this topic and working with children with ASD around 2014, and I did some of the pilot studies uh, before I started the intervention study. And in 2017, uh, I got to do some uh, need assessment among children with ASD in Florida and conducted a nutrition intervention pilot study uh, around 2019, 2020. And because of the COVID, uh, we convert all the materials into telehealth. So uh, we implemented the intervention through telehealth for five early steps providers and five families. And currently we have a pilot randomized controlled trial to evaluate the autism needs, uh, the intervention compared to an enhanced usual care intervention. It will be done in 2023. So this is how it looks, uh, nutrition intervention to promote healthy eating among children with autism spectrum disorder. We have provider manual so that the provider can just go through the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions and with the handouts inside of the manual and then parent handbook has parent instruction and all the handouts. So we have 10 weekly sessions for 10 weeks and two booster sessions um, after that for two months. So these are the topics that we cover in our intervention. So we start with the feeding milestone and uh, parents get to do the goal setting at the time. And lesson two, we cover sensory properties of food so that parents can understand uh, 
why their children are sensitive to a certain food, a texture, and how many times they have to introduce to make their children accept new food. And then lesson three, we introduced the feeding strategies to, um, to improve the uh, food selectivity. And then lesson four, we cover the overall nutrition, uh, dietary intake, and the dietary recommendation for young children and talk about how important to uh, have the variety of food for this age group. And then we also cover food allergies, special diets and supplements in lesson five. And the main uh, message is to really kind of work individually uh, based on their the, each child's needs. And we talk about the beverages and hydration in lesson six. And again, mealtime routine and schedules is very important. So we set up uh, with the parents uh, through the activity, uh, the mealtime routine and schedules. And lesson eight, making healthy choices, easy choices at home and when they eat outside. So we cover that. And hunger and fullness cues um, and then kind of really helping children to improve or develop the self-regulation -regu skills. Uh, we talk about that. And the last session uh, in week 10, we um, talk about maintaining healthy nutrition and set up the long-term goal with the parents. And then we have booster, two booster lessons um, monthly to just check in and encourage them to continue with the behavior change and healthy eating behaviors. We do have the static website repository for parents to download any lesson resources. If they uh, want to see on their mobile phone or mobile devices, they can do that. And um, we also have the social media component. We use Facebook private group and invite parents um, and give more external uh, kind of video link or other resources uh, through social media. So um, again, this is just an overview, the overview of the intervention. We have uh, 10 weekly lessons and booster lesson and website and social media. And providers are implementing um, the sessions within their early interventions uh, service hours. Um, this is just the, the timeline of our study. Uh, the children, um, the parent-child diet will do the baseline assessment. They are randomized into intervention or the control, which is uh, enhanced usual care. And then they do the 10 weekly session. Then we measure them again after 10 weeks. And then they will have the uh, booster sessions and about like five months after they do the baseline, we will have the last follow-up assessment. So to be in the study, uh, we recruit full-time early steps. Uh, early steps is the uh, Florida Early Intervention Program. So early steps providers who had at least one child with ASD in the program during the past year. And of course, uh, um, they have to have the children with the ASD um, to be to be part of the, the study. And uh, children has to be children have to be clinically diagnosed diagnosed with ASD. We require the ADOS report or at least have to have the clinical uh, uh, diagnosis reported in the early intervention system. So because our intervention is uh, total study period is five months, uh, the children should be at least 30 months or younger at the time of the study enrollment. And we exclude uh, children who are exclusively breastfed, taking medication, they may affect the appetite and food consumption, uh, having severe GI conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, any uh, diagnosis other than <clears throat> autism, um, significant uh, medical conditions such as cancer. Uh, if they have a severe food selectivity and feeding disorder, uh, they have to be referred to feeding clinics instead of our intervention. And parents has to be 18 years older because we have um, 
uh, a large uh, Hispanic population in Florida, we also have the Spanish version of the intervention materials. So generally, our lessons are not to treat the autism spectrum disorder. We are to improve mealtime behaviors and improve dietary patterns of children with autism, uh, not necessarily to treat any symptoms uh, of autism. Uh, this is not also a feeding disorder treatment program. So I'm gonna give you just some examples of handouts that we are using. So this is lesson one handouts. Uh, we kind of go over the milestones um, and then have activities with the parents. And then at the end of the lesson, they will uh, set their goal. And in lesson two, we talked about sensory properties of food and really uh, go through the texture, taste, and sound. Even sound can affect uh, children's food preference. So we go over that with the parents. And I adapt the, the effective feeding strategy uh, from uh, the one of the, the intervention book that I use. Uh, it's, uh, it's on the resource page as well that you can find on one up link. Um, the book by uh, Keith Williams. Um, so it has a lot of uh, good information in terms of using feeding strategies, um, paired preferred and non preferred food. So for example, if the child uh, likes crackers, uh, instead of giving the crackers all the time or try to kind of give a totally new food, it is uh, effective to have the crackers and then maybe new dip or spread uh, with it. Uh, they might be more willing to try. And then food chaining is pretty popular. And um, in lesson four, we talk about dietary recommendations and uh, what are the food groups uh, for this age group and then what are the recommended amounts. And again, uh, in one of the lessons, we talked about uh, special diets for ASD uh, and supplements so that parents can understand what are the evidence-based information on these diets and supplements. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, because we are really focusing on behavior changes, um, the families get to do the goal setting around um, the eating behavior and long-term uh, dietary changes. So around lesson six, they do the uh, goal setting for the family. And then at the end of the lesson uh, 10, uh, we let them do the long-term goal setting. This is just to show uh, how our website look like. So parents get to do uh, get to have the access to this website. We have all the lesson materials uh, they can download or they can have access through their mobile devices. This is not publicly available. Uh, we uh, hit the lesson materials, but you can still uh, go to our website uh, asdnutritionstudy.com and then take a look at the uh, lesson outline and the team members if you're interested in. Um, again, the lesson materials are not available uh, to the public, uh, but if you're interested in for our future studies, um, then you can email me through our study email, nutritionstudy at usf.edu. Uh, then um, if you have uh, the further study, probably next year or in the future, I'll be happy to invite you to participate in the study. For now, we only uh, accept uh, parents and providers who are working in Florida. And autism, uh, its social media is to really engage parents um, with other parents and also uh, have other resources, not just from our intervention, but some of the uh, resources available. 
uh, externally. There's one uh, specific um, dietitian that I use often is an autism dietitian. Uh, she has Instagram handle as well, and she has a good visual. So if you're interested in, you may check that out. Um, I also list that on the resource page as well. So in terms of the assessment, we do the dietary intake assessment through three-day free records, um, mealtime behavior assessment with a validated instrument. Uh, we measure height and weight and feeding behaviors, the parental feeding uh, behaviors, demographics, and other health conditions. So this is available. You can download it through this link, uh, which is also on the, the resource list, that it's, it's very simple to use, only 18 items, and people, uh, parent can easily um, complete this, and you can understand what are the problems or mealtime behavior issues that the child might have. Um, so this is an example that we have uh, with one child. The child uh, had significantly elevated problems. So the higher number means the more problematic, problematic behaviors. So there are three different categories and this case has all uh, categories have higher numbers, meaning that it's really the significantly uh, elevated problems in the child. So the reference numbers are from the uh, reference uh, listed below. So this is from the typically developing children. So usually, I mean, uh, a lot of typ typically developing children also sometimes have picky eating behaviors, but compared to those uh, neurotypical children, um, we can see clearly that this child has uh, more problematic behaviors at mealtime. And I, I wanna just talk a little bit about the adolescent teenage um, group that we work with. So we had a, one uh, school-based intervention called bringing adolescent learners with autism nutrition and culinary, uh, culinary education or balance. It was formative study uh, for one of our doctoral students dissertation. And she did a, a eight week school-based nutrition intervention and uh, used quantitative and qualitative assessment. So I'm gonna just show you so, uh, a few quotes from qualitative assessment. So this one is around uh, theme of sensory exposure, 15 year old female. She said, oh yeah, trying new food is what I also like. I liked it because I got to taste the different textures and feelings of it. And then it's, this is around knowledge, 17 year old male. He said, I'm learning things about protein and all and how that's good for diets and fruits and vegetables are the best things to eat. And that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, with my diet. And then this is one of uh, from one of the parents uh, around eating behavior. Uh, during and after completing the balance program, my son named fruits in the grocery store that he would normally not notice. He also felt more comfortable with new fruits and vegetable fruits and even ate a pear, smiley face. And I believe that my son did benefit from balance. Um, so after that uh, school-based nutrition uh, intervention, uh, the, my doctoral student uh, completed her dissertation through a telehealth uh, intervention, doing the pilot efficacy study. Uh, it was one group pre and post design with six groups of adolescents. And then the results showed that uh, the mean BMI uh, improved after the intervention and um, mean added sugar, no, uh, mean added sugar intake significantly decreased. And uh, some of the psychosocial factors also improved after the in intervention, um, such as behavior strategies, self-efficacy, and, and outcome expectations. Uh, however, we didn't see any significant, significant difference for fruit or vegetable intake. So uh, overall, I would recommend uh, for you to have proper assessment prior to any intervention. 
again, individualized approach is very important, especially for early childhood intervention. And uh, we learned that the teenagers were older uh, children, they actually liked having um, intervention in a group setting. They liked the social aspect of it, uh, which I was surprised to learn. So group intervention could be uh, feasible for older adolescents. And sensory activities, uh, incorporating into your inter intervention might be very beneficial and behaviorally focused strategies and eating goals, setting the goal, monitoring always help and um, parents to kind of understand how th their children are progressing in terms of the behavior change uh, would be recommended. Okay, um, so lastly, I would like to see how likely are you to take a training program on nutrition in ASD if offered. So I'll give you about 15 seconds again, go ahead. If you don't see the poll pop up, again, use the chat pod. Hey, Juan, for saving time, we'll just go ahead and move to your next slide for acknowledgements, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is just to acknowledge my uh, co-investigators and research assistants uh, who worked on the, the research study and funding source. Okay, so I will be happy to take any questions or discussion. Okay, I actually have a few questions that have been coming through. I've been tracking, so we can probably get to a few of those before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, one of them that came up was specific to your study that wanted to know why EBF children are excluded, but not EFF children. Okay, what is what is the EDFF? What do you mean? EBF. I, I oh, don't. exclusive breastfed. Okay, thank you. I was going to say, I'm not sure. So formula fed would be EFF. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. So apparently there were some uh, statistics you had up that EBF children were excluded, but not EFF. Oh, I see. We didn't mean to kind of exclude only the breastfed uh, uh, children, but by the age uh, group. Um, so if they are... Uh, six months or older, um, they can uh, participate um, because, you know, they can introduce, they can start introducing uh, solid food um, from four months or uh, on, onward. But if they're exclusively breastfed and uh, parents are not willing to introduce any solid food, uh, then we're not going to, we're not going to enroll them. But if they're exclusively formula fed, uh, but there is possibility they want to uh, introduce the solid food in the early age. So we didn't include that um, as an exclusion criteria. Okay, thank you. I think I have time for at least one more. Um, this one was regarding the assessment of looking at, um, do you specifically assess, excuse me, what specific challenges each child has such as texture, mouth stuffing, sensory, and tailor the incentives? Or in, I'm not sure if it was incentives or intervention, sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Do you assess what specific challenges each child chat has and then tailor towards those challenges? But oh, I see, I see. So we do, um, the, the mealtime behavior problem um, assessment and anthropometric measures, and um, through the kind of like a kind of asking the parents, we ask us whether they the children have a special kind of preference to special texture or some of the problem with the uh, um, sensitivity to certain flavor, and also working with the occupational therapist or speech therapist, we kind of discuss together whether uh, they have the uh, kind of developmental delay in terms of the mouth motor skills or uh, in terms of um, chewing. So we are not particularly doing that assessment uh, ourselves, 
but in a multidisciplinary team, we kind of learn what type of problems they have through occupational therapists and speech therapists. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm gonna um, see if we can get some other questions and answers answered and maybe we can publish those at another time if that's possible. So we can, for sake of time today, keep moving on. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna thank Kiwan for this valuable information and thank you to all our participants also today for joining us and your questions and comments have been fabulous. I love all the references and resources that have come through. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to um, invite everyone to join us in the launch of our 2022 Military Family Readiness Academy this June to explore and understand social justice so you can identify barriers that impact a family's health and well being. Please visit the Academy homepage for course details and to sign up for updates. Our upcoming event is going to be focusing on incorporating nutrition focused physical exams into practice. This webinar provides professionals with tips to improve their nutrition focused physical exam skills, enabling them to provide improved intervention and patient outcomes will be on July 28th, 11 to 12 Eastern time. Continuing education, we have um, a couple resources there for you on this slide. The nutrition and wellness team is offering one CPU for registered dietitian and diet technicians for today's webinar and early intervention credits also will be available um, as well. So once you complete your continuing education or excuse me, your um, valuation link, you will get information on the appropriate continuing education for your uh, discipline. So just make sure you are clicking on the correct link once you receive that information. You'll find the purple evaluation link on the event page to complete that evaluation. Then we'll be directed to fill in your name and email so that certificate can be emailed to you. Just a reminder, government addresses.mil.gov frequently will not accept automated emails, so please use a personal email address. Any questions about your certificate, please contact Kristen DeFilippo. Her email is listed on the slide there. Mm -hmm. A recording of today's webinar will be archived within 48 hours to our YouTube channel, which you can access via the event page. All past nutrition and wellness webinars can be viewed and CPAU credits earned for up to three years post webinar. For webinars offered in 2021, these can also be viewed for up to three years and receive credits. Please visit our nutrition and wellness page for a listing of all these webinars. We invite you to stay connected with the nutrition and wellness team. You can subscribe to Listserv um, for upcoming website or web webinars and blog postings um, through the oneop.org link. And we have put some of the uh, links in the chat box there. We'll keep this up for a little bit longer just so you can get that information. And I once again want to thank everyone for your joining today. Thank you again for joining and we will be ending the session now. Enjoy your day.